everybody. Um, good to see you. Uh, some of our ALI regulars, ALI stands for Advanced Learning Institute. It's one of the weekly programs offered by the Jewish Collaborative of Orange County, but has a national presence. And of course, we invite wonderful teachers from around the country and we invite them to invite their friends. So, so good to see some of you. Welcome. And um, I'm going to, I'm Rabbi Marsha Tilchin. Some of you might know me from Congregation Sons of Israel, maybe not, a long time ago. Um, and uh, we are really excited to have this um, opportunity to learn with Sajan Lane. Um, so take it away, Marcia. I am absolutely thrilled that um, that Jay Crook asked me to teach this because this is an area of um, interest to me that up until recently, I like had, I had no clue. I don't know about you, but I was a lousy at history. I don't understand it. I get my dates mixed up. I get my sequences mixed up. And so I paid very little attention to where all these prophets and people are in relationship to the history of Israel. So some of you know that I'm also teaching concurrently a course on the Haftarot, the three Haftarot of destruction and the seven Haftarot of consolation. And because I am teaching the Haftarot, I got very interested in history and in the prophets, specifically back uh, for that course in the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, who are the prophets of those Haftarot. But because I was interested in that, um, I got kind of expanded. Every time I went to look something up or to investigate something or to read up on something, I got more and more and more interested in the subjects of prophets and prophecy and the place of those individuals in history. So before we do anything, I just wanted to ask a question. When I say the word prophet to you, what do you think? I mean, do you have an idea in your head or a, what do you think? What comes to mind when I say prophet? Anybody can unmute and answer. A man of knowledge. A man of knowledge. Thank you very much. Somebody else. Tortured. <laughs> Say again, Megan. Tortured soul. <laughs> a tortured soul. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Someone who foresees the future. Thank you. Someone who can foresee the future. After all, the word is prophet. You got to see something, right? I think it's a, a, a conduit uh, to a, a conduit to divine messaging. Right. The pipeline. Anybody else? Rosalie, you need to unmute. Rosalie, you need to unmute. There you go. Um, weren't the prophets the ones who read from the Torah? Um, no. No. Well, we don't, we don't, we don't get that in, we don't get a reporting of that. There were people who read from the Torah, um, but they were not necessarily the prophets. The prophets, we're going to talk about what gets codified at what time and who knew what, because you would imagine that all the prophets knew the Torah, but it's not necessarily true. Anybody else have anything else that they think about in terms of prophecy? So um, all of the things that you said, yes, and. So the yes, and is that there were um, prophets before there was Israel, and there were prophets when Israel was in exile. And so prophecy wasn't limited to um, Israelite prophets, and prophecy was not limited to any one time. And um, like the book of Psalms, where we we think we have 150 Psalms, we only have 150 of how many there were. There might have been hundreds and hundreds of them. We only have 150. The same thing is true of prophets. There were probably hundreds of them, um, but we only have the ones that were either mentioned or that had a literary heritage that came down to us. We don't know about the others. 
in the early days of prophecy, prophets came from families or guilds of prophets. There might have been dozens of them. So let me just share with you a little piece of information. This is um, this is what we get from the Torah when we're looking for information about how to judge a prophet. So if anybody would like to read, this is coming up, by the way, this Shabbat. This is the message we're going to get this Shabbat. Who would like to read? No, I'll read it. Thank you. Be careful to observe only that which I enjoin upon you. Neither add to it nor take away from it. If there appears among you a prophet or a dream diviner who gives you a sign or a potent, potent saying, let us follow and worship another God whom you have not experienced, even if the sign or potent name to you comes true, do not heed the words of that prophet or that dream diviner. For your God, Adonai, is testing you to see whether you really love your God, Adonai, with all your heart and soul. It is your God, Adonai, alone, whom you shall follow, whom you shall revere, whom, whose commandments you should observe, whose orders you should heed, whom you should worship, and to whom you should hold fast. Very good. So now we have like a base understanding, the very, very beginning about there are lots of prophets out there. All of the nations have prophets, but concerning the Israelites, um, Moshe, right, in the voice of God says, if, if this person claims to have a prophecy, even if it comes true, which is kind of the weird part, if they are tempting you to go follow other gods, then it's not a, it's not one of your prophets. It's not for you to listen to. Um, and the the um, the punishment or the or the reward for being that kind of a prophet is you get put to death. OK, but but there's more. The Torah has more to say about how to figure out when a prophet is a good sign a good thing for you to follow and in next week's parsha not this coming shabbat but the shabbat after that in parshat shofatim we have this who would like to read go ahead mr tilchin if you're looking to read that'd be great no i can read Yes, okay, uh, Rosalie. Yeah. <clears throat> you must be wholehearted with your God, Adonai. Those nations that you are about to dispossess do indeed resort to soothsayers and augurs. To you, however, your God, Adonai, has not assigned the like. From among your own people, your God, Adonai, will raise up for you a prophet like myself. That is whom you shall heed. So stop for a second, Rosalie. Stop okay. for a second. So who's talking? Who's a prophet like myself? Who's speaking? In Deuteronomy, it's all he does. Moses. Uh, Moses. Moses is talking, right, exactly. Moshe is talking. Okay. And Moshe says, if you have any questions, it should be like me. In other words, God chose me. And I communicate like like uh, Rabbi Tilchin said, I'm your conduit to God. And uh, and I don't rely on auguries or signs or symbols or throwing the bones or any of those things. I'm not the 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 kinds of prophets that are in Israel are not the kinds of prophets that read the entrails of animals. That's not what we do. We get instruction from God. That's what we do. Okay, keep going. Uh, this is just what you asked of your God, Adonai, at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear the voice of my God, Adonai, any longer, or see this wondrous fire any more, lest I die. Whereupon Adonai said to me, they have done well in speaking thus. I will raise up for them from among their own people a prophet like yourself, in whose mouth I will put my words and who will speak to them all that I command. 
Okay, stop for a sec. So here, here are part of the parameters. Um, first of all, the prophet needs to be from among the Israelite people. We have examples of other prophets, even other prophets who speak true, like, for example, Bilam. We have Bilam. He's a perfectly terrific prophet. I actually love Bilam. I think he is an amazing prophet. And what he says comes true, and he only speaks what God tells him to speak, and yet he is not considered an Israelite prophet. He doesn't come from among, among the people. And at the end of the day, Bilam walks off and worships other gods or serves other masters. He does whatever he does, right? But this passage from Deuteronomy is saying the prophets that are the true prophets are from among your people. When they say something, it comes true, and they are devoted to Adonai. They're not trying to tempt you away to worship other gods. So these are some of the parameters of what a prophet has to be. Let's look down at this very last paragraph. Go ahead, Marily, uh, Rosalie, go ahead. You can... uh, the one that says, if the prophet speaks? No, this oh. one down, yes, that one. Yeah. And you should ask yourselves. Um, oh, and you should ask yourselves, how can we know that the oracle was not spoken by Adonai? If the prophet speaks in the name of Adonai and the oracle does not come true, that oracle was not spoken by Adonai. The prophet has uttered it presumptuously. Do not stand in dread of that person. Very good. So, so we have these parameters. First of all, even if somebody says something and it comes true, that doesn't mean that they're an appropriate prophet for the Israelites. It has to be from among the people and devoted to Adonai. If somebody does speak from among the Israelites and is does claim to be devoted to God, as we understand God, but they make predictions that don't come true, nah, sorry, not a prophet. So the question is, is it a, is this person a prophet or not? And uh, is it a prophet for the Israelites? Two different sets of, right? I can't decide what the job description is for a prophet from Baal or the Ammonites or any of those other people. I can only, um, the Torah only tells us these are the appropriate prophets for you. So now, given what has been laid out in the Torah, who do we know not the named prophets, not the ones that we're really familiar with, but who in the Torah, who is the very first prophet, the first person who was attached to Adonai, who spoke the words that Adonai said, who was among the people of Adonai, as much as you can have back then. Who, who do we have? Moses. Moses, most certainly. Before Moses, though, who else? Abraham. 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 Very good. Abraham, the first true prophet, the first person who goes around and says to the people around him, you know, those other gods, they're not gods. They're, they can't control things. And what Abraham says comes to pass. But there's Abraham is another very important distinction. And we're going to look at this description now about the job description of a prophet. Okay. So what is the job of a prophet? Job number one, I, I, I hope you like the, uh, the graphic. It was so much more interesting to look at this once I stuck the graphic on it. Job number one, the job of a prophet is to be a conduit to deliver the message from God to the people. Job number two, a prophet has to speak truth to power. In other words, you can't just stand on a street corner and spout stuff. You have to be willing to go right up to the king or to the priest, the high priest, or anybody who is in a position of power, who is abusing that power, or who is not behaving in accordance with the law, with the Torah. And you have to be able to tell them to their face that they are in deep doo-doo. And the third one, which is really the interesting one for me, is that you have to be willing to stand in the breach. 
And how do we see that for both Abraham and Moshe? How do we see them standing in the breach, playing an intercessionary role? Well, when does Abraham go up against God? In Lot, in the story of Lot. In the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, absolutely. In the story of Lot. Um, So, hang on, let's just do that. Um, Yes, so Abraham has the audacity to go up before God and to say, you know, man, it's not such a hot idea. Let's think about this. And if you think what temerity it takes to do something like that, boy, that's a very that's a very huge responsibility and a big risk, right? You put yourself at risk. But not only that, but when you stand in the breach, it means that you also stand up to people. And my least favorite description is Jeremiah talking about how the people spit on me. They throw things at me. You know, he's like a vaudevillian on a bad stage in dodging whatever's coming at him. Jeremiah does what God tells him to, and he gets no respect for it from anybody. From anybody gets thrown into a pit. We're going to get to Jerry later. But okay, so that's the job. That's the job description. Who gets to be a prophet? Well, first of all, you don't choose. You don't wake up on a bright, sunny Sunday morning and say, I feel a prophecy coming on. And I'm just going to go and stand up in synagogue and declare my prophecy. No, God chooses. God chooses whether you want or not. The prophet has no choice in the matter. Now, sometimes, as we are going to see when we look at some of the prophetic books, the prophets are woohoo, whoopee. You know, when when he, when they hear a voice that says, "Who shall I choose? Who shall I send to to send the word?" Isaiah says, "Send me, send me." Jeremiah says, "I don't know what you're talking about. It is not my gig." They all have different things to say, right? But whether they think that they want this job or not, the job comes from God and they have no choice in the matter. Sometimes the prophet is a a, a known entity. In other words, in early times, before we have all named prophets, there were lots of prophets. We just don't know their names. And sometimes they came from families um, of prophecy. Sometimes they had guilds, you know, little collections of uh, prophets uh, who stuck together. Maybe, you know, you get that street corner, I get this street corner, you get Tekoa, I get Jerusalem, whatever. They had different guilds that had um, like a, a code book, a code book of prophecy. And people knew what you should say or what you should do. Um, a prophet is somebody who steps up who, once they realize they have no choice in the matter, they do what they are told to do. They do these three things. They they deliver the message. They go where God sends them and say what God tells them to. They speak truth to power, and they are willing to stand in the breach. So there were professional prophets, and we see all sorts of that. If you think about prophecy, when does prophecy flourish in, in a community or in a society? It doesn't flourish when everything is hunky-dory, right? You don't need prophets when everything is going well. If everybody is following the commandments and everybody is doing what they're supposed to be, you don't get this sense of prophecy. You don't get people who are called about to deliver the message. Apparently, everybody got the message. You get lots of um, prophets in times of radical social disparity. When the the rich are really rich and the poor are really poor, when governments or kings or, or are not doing what they are supposed to do, not taking care of the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the poor among us, not clothing the naked and feeding the hungry. In those periods, you get lots of, um, 
lots of sense of prophecy. I will share this sheet in the chat. Um, yeah, it's yeah, I, I'm going to share it after the fact. So thank you for asking me to do that. Um, and you don't get it when everybody's following the laws, because honestly, why do you need prophecy that by the way, is Elijah, and I just think it's so much fun. There's Elijah being carried away in a chariot, and Elisha is watching him. So there you get two, two early prophets. Okay. So first of all, now we know what a prophet is. A prophet is a man or a woman. Somebody said a wise man or a woman who, who is a conduit from God, who delivers the message to the high and the mighty as well as the lowly, and who stands in the breach who argues in God's behalf to the people, no matter what the consequences are, and who argues on the people's defense to God. And in many ways, that is the most distinctive feature of prophecy, that you can go back to the source and say, look, you know, there's a problem here. Um, some of you might have been in my other class. I'm not keeping track of who's here and who isn't. But in the other class, I quoted this amazing, amazing uh, teacher, um, Elisa Sperling, who is here up in New York, and who delivered a Dvar Torah about the Haftarah last two weeks ago on Shabbat. And she talks about the needs of the aggrieved to be heard. And that the, the three half Torah of rebuke are God needing to be heard to say, this is what you have done to harm me. This is what you, the people, have done in defiance of me. Those three half Torah say to the people, this is how I have been harmed by your actions. Then we have Tisha B'Av, where the people get to say, okay but this is how we have been harmed and this is how we have suffered and don't you think it's enough and then because god gets the message we have the seven half to wrote afterwards where god says okay comfort to the people I, I i send through the prophet a message of comfort okay so I want to share something else with you. When we think about early prophets, the ones that we are, like if we're going to name prophets, who are the prophets? Just name them all out. Anybody can name them after Abraham and Moshe. Everybody can unmute and just shout them out. Elisha and Elijah. Elijah and Elisha, two very early ones. Yeah, who else? Samuel. Jeremiah. Say it again, Rosalie. Jeremiah. Jeremiah, thank you, a big one. Micah. I, Isaiah. Micah, very nice. Isaiah, very nice. Hosea. Hosea, Hosea, yes, absolutely. Zachariah. Jonah, don't forget Jonah. Jonah, that's right, don't forget Jonah. Long, single Ezekiel. thing. Ezekiel, yes, thank you. Okay, so in, in the very, very earliest of times, before even we see Elijah and Elisha named, we have this other description of unnamed prophets. It comes from the book of Samuel. You're going to have to give me a sec to key it up. Uh, I'm going to play these a little bit in re reverse order, okay? In reverse order. So this is in Samuel chapter, uh, uh, first book of Samuel chapter nine. So this is the description. This is where we get Sam, right? There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, Ben Aviel, Ben Zeror, Ben Bekorach, Ben Afiach, a Benjaminite, a man of substance, and he had a son whose name was Saul. And Saul was an excellent young man. He was handsome. He was tall. This is very important, handsome and tall. As we know, when we think about politicians, handsome and tall really goes a long way. So he has this episode, some of his father's asses go astray, he has to go find them, and they pass through into the country of Ephraim, and when they reach there, 
Saul is worried about this and he says, look, you know, maybe we got to go home so our, our dad is going to forget about the asses and worry about me. And then the servant says, there is a man of God in that town right there. And he is highly esteemed and everything that he says comes true. So perhaps he'll tell us where the donkeys are, right? He's a prophet. Maybe he knows where the asses are. So what are we going to bring him? What have we got? And the servant says, I happen to have a quarter shekel because, you know, even prophets need to make a living. So here's the part that I want to focus on. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he would say, come, let us go to the seer. For the prophet of today was formerly called a seer. And just so we can see that in the Hebrew, I'm going to lay it out differently. Um, so the word seer, the drosh, um, um, let's go to seek God. And here's the word roe, which means a seer, and it comes from the same root as the, as the word for vision, to be able to see something. Okay? So Saul says, okay, cool. And they go and they say, listen, is the seer. They say to these girls, is the seer, you know, is he in the office today? Yes, indeed, he's right up ahead of you. And he's come to town because people are going to make a sacrifice. And so they go and they find the seer, okay? And Samuel was somebody who got revelations from God. Okay, now I'm going to go backwards. Here's Samuel's story. Young Samuel was in the service of the Lord under Eli. And here's this interesting thing. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. Prophecy was not widespread. So why do we think? Maybe. Why do we think? Maybe everybody was keeping the commandments. Maybe everybody was making the sacrifices appropriately right? There wasn't too much trouble. Eli's sons hadn't begun to take too much, uh, too many bribes because that's what happened. And Samuel gets this calling from God. And he thinks it's Eli because he's a little boy. Samuel is a prophet from the time he is a child. And God finally calls to him for the third time, because like in fairy tales, the third time is the charm. And uh, Samuel says, speak, I'm listening. And God says, I'm going to do in Israel such a thing that both ears of anyone who hears about it will tingle, that they, your, your ears are going to prick up. And on that day, I will fulfill it against Eli, all that I spoke concerning his house, because his sons are doing bad things. And there's iniquity in the temple. His sons have committed sacrilege. And so that's why we need a prophet. We need a prophet because uh, bad things are happening, okay? So that's why Samuel becomes a prophet. And that's why Saul goes out to find a seer. Now, I'm going to go down a little bit because there is a, a moment where Saul gets seized by a um, by an ecstasy right so there go up to the hill of god where the philistine prefects reside and as you enter the town you will encounter what a band of prophets you're going to encounter a band of nivim there we have the second word that we use for prophets nivim right? Uh, the word Navi, it means a prophet. And they're going to be coming down with musical instruments, and they'll be speaking in ecstasy. And what's going to happen? The spirit of the Lord will grip you. And you will speak in ecstasy and go and go along with them. And you will become another man, another man in this band of prophets. So that's how we know that prophecy was something that people traveled in packs. And when these signs have happened to you, act when the occasion arises for God is with you. 
And this is how Saul gets tapped. Saul gets tapped for a while and everybody sees him. He turns around to leave. God gives him another heart and all of those signs were fulfilled on the same day and there they are. He comes down the hill, he sees a band of prophets coming towards him and he speaks, Saul speaks in ecstasy. And when all who knew him previously saw him speaking in ecstasy, and the people said, Ish El Re'ehu, one to the other, Kish, what's happened to the son of Kish? Hagam Sha'ul is he also a prophet? But another person said, wait a second, are you sure? Are you sure? Because that's that's like a saying, but that doesn't mean that he knows what he's doing. And sure enough, he can't do it. He stops. All right. So there's this very ambiguous sign about what constitutes prophecy. Saul gets to be a prophet, but not for long. Like Saul gets to be king, but not for long. Okay. Okay. So within Jewish history, um, I like to say that there is the time that you can authenticate because we have other documents, documents from non-Israelite sources. How do we know that David and Solomon existed? Because there are non-Israelite source materials contemporaneous with the time that tell us that David was king and that Saul built the temple and it's in other people's liturgy. It's on other people's books. It didn't come just from us. In that period before time, there's a, a whole lot we don't know. But starting with the period of the kings, we begin to get prophets who are named, right? They don't always have their own books like Elisha, Elijah and Elisha. Um, they don't even have their own books. Some of the later po uh, prophets, like Huldah, the prophetess, doesn't have her own book. And the book, and Devorah, who's a prophet, her prophecy is buried in other books of the Torah. They don't have their own books. But you have to think that there must have been hundreds of prophets roaming around, and the ones that begin to rise to the surface are the ones that have prophetic books. What we're going to look at, I want to just make sure that I have my stuff. Okay. What we're going to look at in the course of these five weeks are the prophets who are named and the prophets who have literary books that we can draw from. In terms of history, these very, very early prophets, they happened during the period of the monarchy when is that? Whoa, it's about 950 BCE. The unified, the, the, the country, the kingdom of Israel rather, has only three kings before it splits up. We have Saul, we have David, and we have Solomon. After Solomon, it splits into an upper and a lower kingdom, a northern and a southern kingdom, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. And Prophets are going to come up in that time of prophecy that are going to begin to create the book of Nevi'im that we have, right? We have um, sections of our, of our Tanakh, we have Torah, and we have the Nevi'im, the books of the prophets, which include the books of Joshua, of Kings, of First and Second Samuel, all of these guys, right? And all the named prophets. And then we have the Kituvim, which includes some people that some people think are prophets. So in the Christian world, Daniel is a prophet. Um, some people think that Nehemiah was, uh, you know, that, that his scribe Ezra was a prophet. There are all these uh, different ways of looking at prophecy. And the Christian world has taken some Israelite prophets and adopted them. And um, re-understood re what they said, all right? I, there is a one way to, to, um, to interpret what the prophets have said, and they live within a bigger context. 
And what they say to us as Jews is not necessarily what they say to Christians or to Muslims. So there are a batch of prophets who are part of the, um, the, the Christian Bible, usually listed in a different order than we see in our Tanakh. And those people have what to say to people of other religions. And once a prophecy is out there, it becomes impossible to say, you've got it wrong and I've got it right. Right? Our Torah is out there. And that means it exists for the fair game use of all the people, which, by the way, is is why I'd like to recommend if you are interested in this idea about what Jews understand about Christian scripture and what Christians understand about Jewish scripture, I would highly recommend anything by A.J. Levine. Amy Jill Levine is the New Testament, the head of the um, New Testament scholarship department at Vanderbilt University School of Divinity. And she's a Jew and she's an Orthodox Jew. And she has this other area of expertise that is looking at the Christian um, scripture through the Jewish lens. Uh, so there's a, a wonderful book called The Jant that stands for Jewish Annotated New Testament, Amy Jill Levine, and also a book called Understanding the Bible, which means understanding all of the Bible, both the Jewish and the Christian Bibles. And it's really amazing to read her stuff because she looks at the prophets and says, well, a first century Jew would interpret this prophecy in this way. And a second century Christian will interpret it somewhat differently. And by the time of 150 to 175 of the Common Era, there were so many different ways of looking at the prophets that um, the, the meaning for early Christians really kind of expanded and blew up. Um, we're not going to look at that, but I just, I just throw it out there. It's really interesting. Um, so when we think about why the prophets books have remained part of our Torah and why we are so dedicated to them, why we read them and why we include them in our um, in our liturgical practice. On every Shabbat, on every festival, on every holiday, and on some days that are kind of modern holidays, like Yom Ha'atzma'ut, we have included readings from the prophets. So why? Why don't we just keep them as prophetic books and read them straight through? Why do we pull out these pieces to read in the all these different other um in all these different other situations any ideas why do we need haftarot eddie edie edie raise your hand edie gets to talk you have to unmute though no Why do we have half Torah? They make the services longer. Why do we bother? Uh, well, I, I mean, first of all, there's a e even within the even within the Torah itself, there's a strong intertextual tradition where there is, you know, one passage from one book is really a commentary on another passage from another book. And I would say that 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 both, you know, what we find in our writings and what we find through the Nevi'im are often really intertextual conversations with the Torah itself. So one reason, I, this isn't really the more historical reason, but I think more of the intellectual reason was that it was inviting commentary into a Torah study conversation. So you didn't just read the Torah stem by itself and then close it up and put it back, but you had a conversation with it by invoking something from the prophets that was related in some way to what we read in the Torah that day. So I think it's intertextual dialogue. 
Okay, great. So we read, we read these things because um, we've always talked back and forth the different books of certainly when somebody asked me about whether the prophets knew the Torah, um, certainly some of them were familiar with the Torah, but the codification of the Torah as of the five books as a separate entity occurs probably around 400 ish BCE, right? Um, Ezra and Nehemia come back with all of the, the um, refugees from Persia. Cyrus of Persia sends them back. They come back and he stands at the, at the gate of the city and reads the book of probably Deuteronomy. So there must have been a codification of some sort by that time, by the time that 450 thereabouts, and the Torah is codified over the course of probably the next, I don't know, 100 years or so. But the books of the prophets are still happening, right? Prophecy is still happening, and we don't get those books codified until about 200 or 250 BCE. So yes, we're talking back and forth. The Torah is talking to the prophets, and the prophets are, are talking back to what they, rem what they know of, of Torah. Other reasons why? I, I just want to ask you for clarification, Mar Marcia. Um, it, it, I, I, already, already in Masechet Megillah, uh, you know, there, there was an established tradition of yes, having a haftarah whenever the Torah was read. But when did it, it, when did, do you know in your research exactly when it started and became a fixed practice? There are mentions of it in, oh, I'm in the wrong piece of, of stuff here. Hang on a second. Um, so there are mentions of Haftarah by 200 CE, 70 CE, at the time of the Roman, the Roman Empire. Not necessarily in connection with the Maccabees, though, that that little bit of um, hearsay that says, well, the Maccabees couldn't study at the time of the of the uh, Hasmonean Empire, the study of Torah was forbidden. And so maybe half Torah are a substitute for Torah, but it isn't mentioned and it isn't mentioned in any of the stuff that I've been able to dig up. The time that we talk about a real kind of codification of half Torah were uh, Rabbi Bar Nachmani, 3rd century CE, who says that there was a scroll of Haftorot. No other description of what that was. So that's very late. So even though we think that there were readings from the prophets, there's not necessarily any, um, there's no evidence that it was in any kind of organized fashion until very late. So one theory that came about is that we have the Haftorot because, not necessarily because Torah study was um, forbidden, not, not specifically that, but because there would have been times when you didn't have, maybe you didn't have a Torah scroll, or maybe the Torah scroll was deemed unkosher, you couldn't read from it. Um, there are all these different situations which you could imagine that you would need something else to read in that sort of as a placeholder and the funny thing is that we actually have a contemporaneous example of that how many of you went to services faithfully during the pandemic and nobody read torah because at my shul we had services and for a while until somebody objected we didn't read torah we only read the haftarah Mm. or we we read from the Chumash, but we didn't read all of it or whatever. You know, it, there were a whole variety of practices that grew up in the time of the pandemic, and the Haftarah was kind of safe, and everybody could do it, and you didn't need a scroll to do it. So Haftarah grows up out of partly a love for the language, right? If you can read something beautiful and you have that, you have that literary tradition, you already have it, then adding it becomes 
Ma'alim B'Kodesh, ascending in holiness. So we have Torah reading, and let's just add on something really beautiful. And then as the Torah, as the Haftorot are, are differentiated and codified, they become um, associated with the parts of the Torah, either because they mimic the language of the Torah or the acting characters, or because there's a mention, like there's a mention in Haftorah, just as God did for Noah. Ah, perfect. This is, there's a mention in the book of the prophets. So great. This is a section we can read when we read Noah. So the, when they were structurally put together, late, not until, not until almost 200 of the common era, according to what scribal, what stuff I've been reading. So we have a very late tradition about Haftarot. I just want to add add something about that too, which is that um, you know there there was really there, there were different cult, cultural traditions that evolved between you know European Jewry and Middle Eastern Jewry, which was already you know that the, the the seeds of that started during the Roman Empire, but of course, you know, really just exploded throughout the Middle Ages, early and late Middle Ages. But to, but the, the last vestige of how this tradition was still evolving is that on occasion, even recorded in Talmudic doctrine was that most of the time, the Spart you know, the, 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 the Far East and the Middle East Jews used the same Haftarah for the same section of Torah, but on rare occasion, they didn't. And so that's sort of a last vestige of how you understand that the tradition of deciding which Haftarah was going to be associated with which segment of Torah was slightly still evolving in the Talmudic era. I just wanted to share that with you. Which is already into like 400. Stuart. Yes, thank you. I can shed some light on this. I learned in a recent shiur that there are references to reading of the um, Haftor wrote um, in the uh, in the New Testament uh, in uh, the book of Luke four and the book of Acts thirteen. There are references to um, the uh, prophets being read in addition um, to the law in the uh, synagogue, um, which would predate, of course, the Talmud, and you know place the reading of the Haftor wrote or the uh, you know the scrolls of the prophets into the first century CE. Cool. My, my lack of knowledge of history includes not knowing when those guys lived. Luke would have been, well, let's see, John is 150. Yeah, Luke would have been Luke around, is predates. Yeah. Luke yeah, Luke predates been, John. Luke would have been around 80 to 85 CE and, and Acts, which is the sequel to Luke, maybe around 100 or 110 CE. So at, at least, you know, a century before the, the Talmud would place it into the, the late first century. That Wonderful. I learn something every time. I'm so happy. Thank you. Um, I want to share a timeline with you. Okay. So when I was trying to figure out where everybody was, I had, um, I really needed something very simple that would tell me who was where. And this is a timeline that helps me figure out where all the prophets begin. Okay, so we know that in Saul's time, or in his book, certainly, there's this discussion of prophets, but without names. By the time we get to King David, and the books of Kings, we're beginning to get names of prophets, including women. After Solomon, we have the split of the kingdom of Judah from the kingdom of Israel. And right in around the same time as Isaiah, we're gonna get um, Amos and Hosea are the same, they kind of overlap, their lifetime overlaps with Isaiah, all right? That's where you see the first big burst of literary prophecy, prophecy. And, and if I'm not mistaken, Marcia, the, 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 some are residing in the north and some are residing in the south. So and some, and some are, are some, the ones who are, yes, Marcia, and 
from what I've been reading and from my scholarship, I don't want to say scholarship, from what I've been reading and studying, um, some of them were in, um, they were like on the border because they would go to Jerusalem and then they were prophets from the north, but they were also going right over the border of the kingdom into Jerusalem. So there was a, there were prophets to Israel, prophets to Judah, and prophets that kind of tread the line. So for example, Isaiah lives at the time of the, Assy the rise of the Assyrian Empire. He is prophesizing primarily to the north, which falls, but he's also looks at the south and realizes that he looks to, to Judah and realizes that Judah still stands and Jerusalem still stands and the temple still stands. And so he has these other prophecies within his book of comfort and of the flourishing of the people under, you know, even at the, the time that the north falls. Then we have Hezekiah, builder of the famous water tunnel. I love Hezekiah. And about a hundred years after Isaiah, we have Jeremiah. Jeremiah is going to be around for the um, Babylonian Empire for the destruction. And then when um, the Jews get hauled off, uh, Ezekiel is almost entirely in Babylonia. And that's where his prophecy is. And those are the big three. And all of the others that we're going to look at fall mostly in the kingdom of Judah because they're going to be mostly in this period of time from the end of the, um, from Jeroboam on, right? Somewhere around here where the, where the kingdom split, that's where we're going to find this proliferation of prophets in Judah. So there's a little, um, a quick primer. It helps me to see it without too much information. And what we'll do is um, when we post this recording on the on the website, we'll also include uh, the these sheets so that you we can all refer to them because it's really helpful. These visual aids, if you if you're comfortable sharing those, Marcy. Of course, I would have made them into um, shareable links before, but I created them yesterday and I didn't have a chance. So I'll do. All right. Okay. I, I, can I open this up to questions just because, I mean, this was I was really just going to so do that. Um, I was just going to do that. I was just going to say, so in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start with the very, very earliest of prophets, Elisha and Elijah, who I adore and whose stories abound. And a lot of the other stories that we get at the very early part when we talk about Kings, the books of Kings, and we're going to go not chronological, but we'll go from there. Any questions, any thoughts? Stuart. Yes, um, unless you want to save this for the last session, I was always curious, um, why and when did prophecy end? I read different, you know, dates and different reasons. I mean, do you want to save that for the end or? No, I want to say a moment about that. Thank you for reminding me. Sometimes I don't make a, a tick list of what I want to say and then I get a little lost. So, you know, there's this sense that just as God did miracles in the time of the Torah, that God retreats from history throughout time. And as human beings become more responsible for history, more responsible for, for carrying out the, the mitzvot and for being aware of each other and for taking care of each other, that there's this this feeling that God doesn't make miracles like that anymore. And God retreats from history. God retreats from history. God is hiding. Like, where is God and during the, the Holocaust? God is there. God suffers along with Israel, along with the whole world. But we don't get that same sense that we have in Scripture of God being a force acting, pushing and pulling in history. And I think that we have the same feeling. This is what my feeling is about prophecy, is that the, the time of prophecy leaves as, 
as God retreats from history, that there's a time when prophecy is no longer going to be efficacious. And also there's a time when it becomes hard to, to hold a standard. You know, if our standard is they have to say something that comes true, they have to be uh, adhering to God and, and, you know, not trying to take the people away from God, like the, the Muslims would say prophecy existed up until the 700s of the common era. You know, there, there are prophets in other religions, but our prophecy, our period of prophecy stops. And now our job is to kind of mine it for, for, for wisdom, for knowledge. Sylvia. That kind of disturbs me a little bit, because if you say that um, the prophets recede because God retreats from our world, I mean, it leaves me with the feeling of, okay, everything went bad, it all went to crap, and now God's out of here. Well, no, I don't think I mean that. What I think I mean is that um, God doesn't push the pieces on a chessboard you know, there's this sense in the Torah, it says, if, if you go to war and God is on your side, then you're going to win. Right. right? And right. that, that, that sense of, of history, it, 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 I don't feel it being, I, I, I mean, I don't think that that's how we view God, God's presence in the world anymore. I think that we see God, oh, Marsha, Jump in. I, I, I just want to say, too, I, I think it's really important to understand that we have seen prophecy in action in the last 2000 years. It really has happened there. there I, I think one could argue that some of the some of the capacities, even of like um, Reb Shlomo Ben Yitzhak Rashi, for example, his capacity to um, and it wasn't obviously perfect, but his capacity to sort of like understand layers of inaccessible meaning a thousand years after, you know, Torah or whatever. Excuse me. Hold on a minute. Sorry. No, I, I want to, first of all, agree with you. And, I, and but I think that the fact that we can draw on prophecy and see it working in our lives, yes, even yes. though the prophecy was. 3,000 years ago, you know, like 2,700 years ago. Right. And, and so I, I want to say like, so, 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 so my, so the, the, the great minds that have communicated certain things that endure today is what I'm saying. There were, there were many, there was much great Jewish scholarship that we have lost. We don't know, but sort of like Maimonides, Rashi, the, the, the great rabbis who are able to communicate something that had endurance a is big. And then I would even say somebody like, I remember a, a woman that I went to rabbinic well, JTS with felt in her bones that somebody like Debbie Friedman was in fact a prophet in modern prophet. And, and, and there's, you know, whether you liked her music or not, she understood that it was time for a new idiom with a, a take an old tradition. And if you went to her funeral, as I had the, un, the, the, the sad privilege to be at, she, every great Jewish musician from the eighties, nineties and beyond said she started it. So when I think about that, she, I mean, and there's so many others like, I mean, but, but she was exceptional. So, so I just let me just, to, let me just, just, yeah, let me just say something. Let's say that the time of classical prophecy has ended, right? That there was a, 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 um, a codified classical prophecy and that that period has been closed. And it doesn't mean that there isn't prophetic, that there aren't prophetic voices out there, but that this particular genre of prophecy played out its time. And, uh, and, and we still have prophetic voices to listen to. And what one could say all the, the people who warned us about global warming were prophetic. And, and that exists and will always, I think, exist. But this notion of a classical prophetic tradition that is linked to Torah 
and and exists within a, a context of Jewish history that is closed in the same way that Talmud is closed, but we keep writing new stuff. By the way, look, I want to close with this. I think that you're association with what's happening with global warming now. If we wondered what life was like back in the day when no one listened to the prophets who knew what was coming down the pike and told people and everything was destroyed anyway, I think what's happening in the world with global warming, that there's just such corporate fascism that has just controlled things so that nobody is willing to hear or listen or whatever. You know, we're, we're, we're all gonna go down the tubes together in spite of the wisdom that uh, has been shared for the last 50, last five decades. Anyway, on that happy note, um, we uh, I hope you'll uh, watch this again. Marcia, what are we gonna be learning about next week? Next week, we're gonna do the very, very, very earliest guys, Elijah and Alicia, and uh, maybe we'll get to Amos, but I don't think so. And I wanna look at those like they're prophets who are just named. They don't even have like a story almost. I want to know about those guys. I'm excited about those guys. Thank you. This is the storytelling one, Marsha. <laughs> a great class. Big, big applause for you. Thank you so much. You're a, you're a master teacher. Have a Thank wonderful you. week, everybody. We we'll look forward to seeing you very soon. Bye. Bye, y'all.